And Rob Kate is going to come forward for this morning's reading of the contemporary complimentary text this morning. Come on, Rob. Okay. Today's scripture verses are from Revelation chapter 6, verses 7 through 8 and 15 through 17. When the Lamb opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come! I looked, and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death, and Hades was following close behind him. They were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, and plague, and by the wild beasts of the earth. Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and everyone else, both slave and free, hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They called to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can withstand it? Thank you, Rob. Thank you very much. You know, in the scriptures, it talks about both God's grace, love, kindness, and forgiveness. And as a minister of the gospel, this is what I preach through the cross of Christ. But as Rob just read in Revelation, there's also the wrath of the Lamb of God that is coming at the end of time. And so now we live in a time of grace, a time of the gospel, to share that with people. And so during this time of pandemic and turmoil and strife and economic brokenness and confusion in our nation and around the world, I wanted to take today to make the pandemic cure a second message, really emphasizing the blood and the cross of Jesus Christ. Because as we look at the truth of that in the backdrop of society in which we live today, we can see the relevance and the power that we have a vaccine. It's called the Gospel of Jesus Christ. And it saves people from the pandemic of death and eternal destruction that's waiting for all men and women born. It is the story of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And I felt compelled by the Lord to exalt the Lamb of Christ today in light of what we're facing so that we have this present day illustration that will motivate us to share the truth of Christ in a world that is dying. Many people are dying because of the COVID-19 virus, but everybody is dying from the virus of sin and death. And we hold the vaccine. We hold the vaccine. You know, the world is looking for the certain medical lab or the certain scientist or doctor or the CDC to come up with this virus that we can give to people to calm people's nerves and save lives of people who are dying horrible deaths in the hospital. You've seen the footage. It was the old and now it's the young, covering the gamut of people. And now in our country there's been a resurgence. It's really the first wave that came down from New York and the Northeast and it's sweeping towards the Southwest into Florida, Texas, and California, Nevada, and the rest. It's affecting everyone. And so this is what we're going to talk about today. Let me open in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we're grateful today that we can open up your word and see what's true about you, see what's true about us, see what's true about the world. Father, there's many things in your word that's so wonderful and comforting and strengthening and, and peace-giving. But there's also things in your word that let us know that you take sin very serious and that you allow things, or sometimes you bring things to a nation or to a world to get their attention. Father, we learned from your word that you were really concerned about the eternal destiny of men, not their comfort, not their wealth, not their power, not their position, but their eternal destiny. And so, Father, as Christians today, especially here at Living Faith, we want to use this opportunity that we have today in the light of the pain and the death and the confusion, against that backdrop, bring the light of the gospel of Christ to people. And so, Father, as we look at this passage today, I pray that you'll help us remember that well, and we're grateful. 
in Jesus' name. Amen. You know what's been unique about this plague, this pandemic that's spreading across the world, spreading across our nation, is that it's had so many side effects, so many peripheral things. It's like a domino effect from the center. You know, it's brought um, economic downturn and stress and fear, and people have lost their businesses, lost their, their um, means of economy, their, their paychecks, they're stuck at home, they're sheltering in place, they, they can't get the benefits that they need from the state. You know, it's just caused this ripple effect where restaurants are closed, bars are closed, all the places of entertainment are closed, and people have lost their livelihood, people have lost their businesses, people have lost their income, they've lost their benefits. They can't go anywhere, they're stuck. And the government isn't much help, the check isn't showing up in the mail. And so people are suffering both financially, both emotionally, physically. You know, we see in the news now that the hospitals are filling up in Texas and in Florida and other places where there's hot spots and they're at capacity. And now they're saying that this pandemic is causing sickness not only for the old and aged, but for the young. It's moved now. The average age of those with COVID in, uh, in the states that have seen a rise in the pandemic, the average age now has gone from 65 to 35. So as a Christian in the world today, and as a Christian leader, and as a teacher of God's word, I look at these things, and I need to pay attention. I think that we need to pay attention. Did God cause this? I don't know. Has God allowed this? Obviously. Should we pay attention? I think so. <laughs> you know, the world and its system and society and, and the human heart is not going to get better. It's only going to get worse. And of course, the prophets and the apostles make that clear. I'm not really saying anything new. So what's interesting about this pandemic is it's causing a lot of other things in our society and in our culture. And as we look at the portrait of God in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, we see, we see the same God. And I want to base, I want to base this um, message today in the light of God's character. You know, that's really a guiding principle for interpreting the scriptures, his character. You know, God is both merciful and kind and forgiving and love everlasting. And he proved that at the cross of Christ by sending his son, the prince of glory from eternity, my only begotten, to die on a cross and shed his blood that your sin might be cleansed. It's the blood of Christ that is the vaccine for sin and death. And it cleanses us and makes us clean and it, it gives us forgiveness before the throne of God. God is so rich in mercy. But God is not just merciful, God is also holy. As we sung this morning, He's righteous. He is eternal. He is sovereign. He is all powerful. He speaks, and universes come into being. He breathed into Adam and brought a clay sculpture laying on the ground. He brought it to life and it stood up and started talking and relating to God. This is the kind of God in the Bible. Yes, he is merciful, but he is also holy and righteous. And he has to deal with the toxicity of sin and death in the world. And the vaccine is the blood of Christ. And we see this so well in the story today in Exodus chapter 11 and 12. And um, I can't go into the whole story. I want to try to bring out just some principles from the story today. So if you have your Bibles or tablets, turn with me to Exodus chapter 11 and 12, and we'd like to spend some time there this morning. This is really part two of the pandemic cure message. I felt compelled by the Lord to keep going with this truth and really bring out uh, the provision of Christ as seen in the story of Exodus where the people of Israel, along with Moses, had taken the blood of the lamb in a bowl with a hyssop branch, and they brushed it on the mantle and, and doorpost of their door late one night in the nation of Egypt so that the angel of death would pass over their door because saw the blood of the lamb, and so they were spared death. 
Now, I just told you pretty much the entire story of Exodus 1 through 12 in that single <laughs> statement. And I'm learning to do this as a pastor because it only got 25 minutes. <laughs> so i got to be really to the point and synchronized. And so I just really told you the point of the sermon before I start is that as I looked at pandemics and plagues and famines in the Bible, I saw as I was speaking last Sunday in part one that God obviously uses these as vehicles and instruments to bring discipline, to bring attention, to bring correction, to bring his knowledge to people. And um, last week we were looking into the book of Chronicles at the life of Solomon, King Solomon and King David. And I don't want to rehearse that sermon from last Sunday, but I just will remind you that it was when Solomon had made all the sacrifices in the temple on the day of dedication to let God know that they love him, they count on him to provide for their means of forgiveness. And the sacrifices in the altar were representation of Jesus Christ and what he would do. Don't miss it. When you remember that Jesus Christ is the key to the interpretation of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, you'll have the right interpretation. Amen. So when you see the temple, you see Jesus. And so when we saw Solomon making those sacrifices, and then Jesus came to talk with him later that night in the palace, if you remember, and said to him, Solomon, I want you to know something, that if things start to go wrong for your household, your palace, your nation, if there's locusts spreading around, if the rain doesn't fall and there's famine, if there's a plague sweeping through killing people, I, I want you to know that you can come to me. And it says there, the famous statement says, in 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, it says, If my people who belong to me will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then I will hear from heaven. I will see their humility, their prayer coming to me. I will hear their prayers and I will forgive their sin, forgive their sin, Old Testament, Christ. And I will heal their land. So this is the way that God operates. And that was really my big point from last week's sermon. Of course, Solomon knew the way that God operated because he saw it in, his, in the life of his father, King David. Because King David had made a mistake with the census. And because of that, God brought a plague that swept down the, from the north in Israel, down to the south in Judah, and was about to hit the city of Jerusalem. And, and David was crying out to God, and, and God stirred up the prophet Gad to go talk to him and say, look, if you'll make a sacrifice on the uh, plot of land of Uriah, the Jebusite, he was right outside the Jerusalem walls, then the plague will stop. And so that's exactly what Dave, David did. He made that sacrifice and the plague stopped. So when I read that story, and so I'm reading the story of King Solomon, I see the background of King David, and I see that God operates this way. That he wants humility, and he wants us to seek him, and he wants us to be humble, and he'll forgive, and he'll heal. And if we make some kind of mistake, or we go off track, and something bad starts to happen, that we can come to him, and he will correct things. This was a spiritual thing that was going on. You know, in the story of 1 Chronicles chapter 7, we see that when David made the sacrifice, he and his entourage, along with Uriah the Jebusite and his sons, they looked up into the sky and they saw an angel standing mid-sky with a sword pointed down towards Jerusalem because he was causing the plague. And the Lord Jesus said to the angel of death or the angel of plague, sheath your sword. And so he put it back into his sheath like this. And they're all like, wow. <laughs> and the plague stopped right there before the gates of Jerusalem. So I read stories like this and I realize that in 2020, you know, we're, we're thousands of years ahead of this story, but in 2020, as a teacher of God's word, I need to pay attention to that. We need to pay attention to that and not just think, oh, this is just some blown up virus of the flu and we shouldn't be so concerned. When I see hundreds of thousands of people dying, when I see bodies stacked in freezer trucks, when I see bodies stacked in unmarked graves, when I see economies shutting down and things are closed and people are stuck at home, I would 
think that maybe something's going on. Maybe God is trying to get this nation or the world's attention. He listened. My son's return is right around the corner. And you guys have gotten so comfortable, so careless, so callous, so carnal. I need to snap my fingers in front of your face and wake you up. There's more to life than just your comfort zone. And now what's happened? Our comfort zone is gone, isn't it? <laughs> Completely gone. Interesting. So, as I was rehearsing the stories of Solomon and David, I saw the way God operates. And so then I saw the way God operates in the book of Exodus. Because I went through and I studied many plagues and famines in the Bible. And I saw a running theme. That God knows about it. God allows it. Sometimes God causes it to get our attention. So it's a big story, and I have to make it small. So bear with me. So here's the story. Let me just retell it briefly. God had called Abraham to the promised land. At some point, Abraham had Isaac. Isaac had Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. This was the birth of the nation of Israel. At some point, they went from the promised land into Egypt because there was a great famine that caused them to go there. No coincidence. God uses these things. So over the centuries, the 12 tribes of Jacob, the 12 sons of Jacob, grew into the nation of Israel, probably 2 million people plus, and they were the slaves of Egypt. And they were under great bondage and persecution and death from the Egyptians. So God had built this nation in the protection and custody of Egypt, and now it was time to call them out of Egypt back into the promised land as a nation. And so God raises up Moses, a prophet, to go back and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. It's time for them to come and worship me and serve me. But what happens is Pharaoh and the people of Egypt are full of pride, carnality, carnality and idolatry. Their land was full of all kinds of idols. They were an, an idol people. So what happens is that when Moses asked Pharaoh to let the people go, as we begin to rehearse Exodus, uh, Pharaoh says no. Time and time again, his heart is hardened. And so what does God do? Brings ten plagues to get their attention, to snap them out of it. These are my people. There's a distinction between them and you, and you need to let them go to come and worship me at my holy mountain which was Mount Sinai. Fascinating story. So what plagues does God bring? I'm just going to name them one by one and go through real quick. So we're going through Exodus, and we see that God brings about plagues. And the plagues that he brings about are, he brings a plague of blood. He turns all the Nile River and all the ponds and lakes into blood, which freaks people out and they can't drink, and the place stinks. The Bible said it stinks. Everything in the Nile died. So this is horrific, right? This is probably getting their attention. Of course, uh, Pharaoh doesn't listen, and so then God brings a plague of frogs. So many frogs that they're in their beds, they're on their eating tables, they're in their houses. A plague of frogs getting their attention. After the frogs, he brings a plague of gnats. You know those little buzzing things? And they were so thick that they filled their homes, filled their clothes, filled their hair. Gnats everywhere. How annoying is that, right? So, of course, these people were freaked out, scared, and not sleeping. They were probably sleep deprived because God had brought blood to the river, frogs to their communities and now they fill their homes with gnats and now this third the fourth plague he brings is flies <laughs> now we hate flies right mm -hmm. sometimes there'll be one or two flies in here in the summer and you can notice it it's annoying and bugging bugging you can you imagine if your home was filled with flies that's what the scripture says their home they were in swarms they covered the ground they covered their table they covered their bed they were in their house they couldn't get rid of them Flies swarming everywhere. That was the fourth plague. Then things got really serious. 
The fifth plague was that God killed, gave a plague and killed off all their livestock. Their sheep, their goats, their cattle all started to die off in this plague. And of course, if you have thousands and thousands of cattle and sheep, which was part of their community, part of their agricultural community, you can imagine the, the flies and the smell and the loss of food. Now they're experiencing famine along with annoying pests, along with, with stink in the land. And who's doing this? The Lord Jesus is doing this. Then he goes on to give the people boils. He says to Moses, go to Pharaoh, say, let my people go. Pharaoh's heart will be hard and say, no, they're not going. They are our slaves. They are building our cities. You cannot go. And the Lord said to Moses, Moses, grab a, a handful of dust from the ground and throw it into the air as it begins to spread across, and it grows, and it spreads across the community. And as it falls on people, it causes boils. It's both supernatural and physical, isn't it? That's what you need to notice about that. So now the people's pain is on them. Notice how God ups the caliber, turns up the value of the heat. Now they're experiencing boils and pain. So then the sixth plague is that he brings hail. Hail and thunder so hard and so ferocious that it says in the text, there's not been a storm like this in the nation of Egypt since the beginning of time, nor will there be anything like it until the end of time. And the thunder and the hail just stripped the trees, stripped the crops, ruined their fields, and their country is becoming a wreck. So I'm reading this, and I'm like, oh, Egypt is becoming a wreck. 2020, oh, America's becoming a wreck. The world is becoming a wreck, a train wreck, in a lot of different levels. And so as someone who takes the Bible serious and takes God serious, by the way, I would look at that and wonder what's going on. As Moses was talking to Pharaoh and wanting him to let the people go, and every time he pronounced a plague that was coming upon them because he hardened his heart, uh, Moses kept saying to Pharaoh from the Lord that the reason I'm doing this was so that you might know I am the Lord and there is no other. The earth is mine and I am here. Moses and Aaron keep saying those three or four things to Pharaoh and to his court as the Plagues are coming to destroy their land, their economy, their crops, their cattle, their health. It's all getting crushed. And so Pharaoh and the officials are saying, why, why is your God doing this? As Moses is standing there walking out, which he did time and time again in Pharaoh's court, he said, Pharaoh, so that you and your nation might know that the Lord God is God and there is no other and this earth is here, this earth is his, and he is here. Those are the things that they say repeatedly. I found that interesting. And maybe that's what we need to know today. The Lord God is God, and the earth is his, and he is here. These are the principles that I learned from the scriptures and about who God is. Because this is what the Bible is for, to understand who he is. He's not only merciful and kind and forgiving, but he's also just and righteous and holy. And he wants us to acknowledge him and give him the honor and worship that he's due. So there's more plagues coming. There was a plague of boils. There was a plague of hail. There was a plague of locusts. There was a plague of darkness. That's interesting. So the sun is shining but the land of Egypt is completely dark. In the scriptures it records that the darkness was so heavy, they couldn't see their neighbor across the road. They couldn't see their neighbor next door. And it says that the darkness was so heavy that they could feel it. They could feel it. Supernatural darkness. So God is bringing these plagues, and so these were the nine plagues. 
all of the frogs and gnats and flies and locusts and hail and boils and darkness. And still, Pharaoh would not let God's people go. And so this brings me to the point of today's message, plague number 10, which was the firstborn in every house of Egypt would be killed. And the only thing that would prevent the firstborn of every house from being killed would be the blood of a lamb that they would wipe on the mantle of the door, which I just had talked about at the beginning of the message. The blood of the lamb. So Moses walks into Pharaoh's courtroom one more time and says, let my people go. I just want to pick it up here in verse 27 of chapter 10. So he goes in to announce this play again. But the Lord hardened, verse 27 of chapter 10, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he was not willing to let them go. Pharaoh said to Moses, Get out of my sight. Make sure you do not appear before me again. The day that you see my face again, you will surely die. Just as you say, Moses replied, you will never see my face again. I will never appear before you again. And Moses, hot with anger, walked out. And so what's going to happen now is that as he's walking out, he gives them the tenth plague. He's walking into the courtroom and he says this, chapter 11, verse 4. So Moses said, this is what the Lord says now to you, Pharaoh. About midnight I will go throughout Egypt. Every firstborn son in Egypt will die. From the firstborn son of Pharaoh who sits on the throne to the firstborn son of the female slave who is at her hand mill and all the firstborn of the cattle as well. There will be a loud wailing throughout Egypt worse than there has ever been or ever will be again. But among the Israelites not a dog will bark or any person or animal. Then you will know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel, between the world and God's people. All these officials of yours will come to me, bowing down before me, saying, Go, you, all the people who follow you. After I leave, then Moses, hot with anger, left Pharaoh. The Lord had said to Moses, Pharaoh will refuse to listen to you so that my wonders may be multiplied in Egypt. Moses and Aaron performed all these wonders before Pharaoh, but the, Lord's, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not let the Israelites go out of his country. Two things I wanted us to notice that God says here, the reason he's doing this plague and all the plagues is to make a distinction. Why would God cause plagues? Why would God cause famine? Why would God crush a nation like Egypt? God gives Moses the answer, Moses gives Pharaoh the answer, and here's the answer for all of us. He makes a distinction between his people and the world, between Israel and Egypt. And it says here that he performed this so that his wonders might be seen. And this, was, this would go along with what Moses and Aaron were saying to Pharaoh and the officials and to the nation, is that you need to know that the Lord God is God. This earth belongs to him. And he is here. So interesting that they added that. The Lord said, tell them this, I'm here. They didn't think that he was here. They didn't know who the Lord God was. They didn't believe in the God of the creator of heaven and earth. They had all these other weird gods with the body of a man and the head of a calf or the body of a man and the head of a bird. They worshiped the God of death. Do you know that? They worshiped the God of Hades. The God of the Nile, the God of the sun, the God of the moon, the God of the crops, the God of the soil, the God of the frog, the God of the fish, the God of the crocodile. They, they worship everybody but Jesus. And this was the whole point of the plagues, to get their attention. And that's why God kept saying that to them through Moses. So that you might know that I am the Lord God. I alone am the Lord God. And the earth is mine, and I am here so Moses proclaims the tenth plague. And if you just give me a few more minutes. The tenth plague is that the firstborn of each house will die. The most important passage I want to focus on, the most important paragraph, is in Exodus chapter 12. 
So Moses leaves the court of Pharaoh, goes back to the Israelites and to their elders and leaders, and this is what he says about what God said. Then Moses summoned, this is chapter 12, verse 21. Then Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go at once and select the animals for your families and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it into the blood in the basin of the bowl, and put some of the blood on the top and both sides of the door frame. None of you shall go out of your door or your house until morning. When the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the top and the sides of the door frame, and he will pass over the doorway. And he will not permit the destroyer to enter your house and strike you down. So this 10th plague, this one recorded in Exodus, is so symbolic and so pinnacle and so important, representing what Christ has done for us at the cross. Do you know that in those adobe houses that they lived in in Egypt, that they would take wooden beams that were either four by four or six by six and put them on the sides and at the top and they'd make the adobe brick and the plaster around? And they were wiping the blood on those beams. Same kind of beams, Jesus died. Pretty fascinating, isn't it? And so this is representing of who Christ is and what he's done for Israel. They might be delivered from bondage and from death. And so I want to translate this ancient story to today. Because we have the cross of Christ, the Lamb of God, the blood of the Lamb on the cross that forgives us from sin, delivers us from death. This, this is the translation. This is the meaning for us today. And so we have this answer. We have this vaccine for the world that's lost and confused and hurt and going in the wrong direction and hold on to everything but Christ. And so we should be like Moses and Aaron going to Pharaoh, Christians going to the world. And letting people know, hey, listen, there's one God, there's one Lord, his name is Jesus Christ, this earth belongs to him, and he is here. And that's our answer, that's our vaccine. The gospel of Jesus Christ is our vaccine. The world is waiting for a vaccine today. And everyone born is born with a virus that will kill them the virus of sin and death. What does the Bible say? What does the Apostle Paul said? Who knew Jesus Christ face to face, stood before his throne, then came back to earth, wrote most of the New Testament on the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. In the book of Romans, what did Paul say? For the wages of sin, the result of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. This is the vaccine. You know, it's interesting that um, we have the Center for Disease Control. And I thought that the church could be the Center for Disease Cure. We could be CDC, right? Right. Right? The Center for Disease Control. We could be the church with the disease cure, the disease of sin and death. And we have the cure, don't we? The blood of Christ. It's the vaccine. I'll end with the word. There's so much more I wanted to say. And of course, I always have three sermons up here and i got to make it into one because I'm out of time. Um, but I just want to end with the words of the Apostle John because he says it so well. As we think about the blood of Christ, the blood of the Lamb, the forgive us of our sin, the vaccine for sin and death, we have this to offer to the world. As the end of time is nearly here, the return of Christ is nearly here. And we hold the answer. We've got to get out there with the vaccine. People desperately need it because they're dying. They'll die in their sin. And they'll step into a Christless eternity. And we wouldn't want to wish that on anybody. The Apostle John, he always says things so well. This is what he says here. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with, the, with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Did you hear that? I love that. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us, vaccine, purifies us from all sin. 
Heavenly Father, we're grateful today that we could glimpse into this story, this big epic story for just a few minutes and look at the wonder of what Jesus did for us, how he was represented in the blood of the lamb that was wiped on the door and how we can see the blood of the lamb that was shed on the cross and that this is the way that you provide forgiveness of sin, a way out of the plague of sin and death. Restore the relationship with you and give us eternal life. How wonderful, how wonderful, we're grateful. Lord, you have called us to share this, to share this story and be brave in this new world. We need to be brave in this new society and share this story with others that they too might be saved. Help us to do that here at Living Faith by your Holy Spirit and we're grateful. In Jesus' name, amen.